we went to Disneyland uh, a number of years ago when my daughter was six or seven, and we uh, um, ended up going to uh, uh, watch Aladdin, the play Aladdin. And as as we're uh, watching the the, the play, um, it gets to the part where the carpet takes off, and for my daughter. Um, it was a magical moment. Uh, she wholeheartedly believed that it was all magic. There was smoke and mirrors and the lighting. And, and, and I thought to myself, uh, this is in many respects how the magic of the market works. What we don't see um, are the people who prepare everything to make the market work. Like my daughter didn't understand all the preparation that went into making that magic carpet ride happen. Uh, many people don't understand um, the things that we get right to make our markets and our society function. So for example, if I was to give you uh, the option, let's say you are going to be in an earthquake, and I say it's going to be an 8.5 earthquake. You have the opportunity to be in the 32nd floor of a building in San Francisco or in Turkey. Um, where do you want to be, Istanbul, Turkey, or San Francisco? Um, some of the things we do, including regulations, help make our life better. Uh, the vaccines that we do for each other uh, in the different states, the health programs, the education programs that we have. So a lot of things, the things that the state does right and we don't see, don't acknowledge, um, those things are absolutely necessary for making our markets function. So in that uh, example with the Magic Carpet Ride, uh, there are a lot of things that we don't see in the background, just like you don't see the pulleys, the people the, uh, who make things work in the background. Um, the magic of the market is much like the magic carpet ride um, uh, at, uh, in, the, in the Disney Aladdin play. And, and so because we don't understand that most people don't understand them doesn't necessarily mean uh, that they don't exist. So the magic that happens is actually a function of many things coming together and not simply because an individual decides they have a great idea and they want to make money. Perhaps the biggest myth is that um, the state is an impediment to uh, markets, growth, wealth creation, and the like. Um, but uh, one of the points that I make in the book is, is it's very clear that the state actually creates the conditions under which wealth is created. Without the modern state, we would not have the levels of wealth creation that we have today. And so what I try to do is explain how it is that the state is absolutely necessary for creating wealth. Today. And so uh, one of the things I try to explain is that if you look at uh, the state, especially in the United States, um, there are a lot of things we get right. Um, and what, among those is creating opportunities. So in order to help create those opportunities, what we have to do is, and what we have and continue to do, is we remove obstacles. So for example, we don't allow monopolies, we don't allow trusts, uh, we have very strong civil rights, we have women's rights. We have property rights, and we enforce all of these things. If you go around the world and look at states that don't get this right, um, they don't have uh, very prosperous economies. We work hard at getting legal rights and property rights and these type of rights right. And so the state is absolutely necessary for helping to create opportunities for everyone. Uh, we are led to believe, and we want to believe, that the rugged individualist is the one who makes things happen. The, the entrepreneur with the great ideas makes things happen. Uh, we have a long history about uh, people moving westward, the entrepreneurs, the pioneers. But a lot of people don't even think about or never learn about that that movement west was a direct result of the federal government saying, we're going to move westward. And uh, not only are we going to move westward, but we're going to develop a lot of programs to help this movement westward. So whether it was using the United States Army to clear off the Indians, whether it was the Army Corps of Engineers for infrastructure and canal programs, projects, whether it was the Department of Agriculture, which helped to share information and get information out about markets and, and, and crops uh, to farmers. All of these things helped uh, create the conditions for people to become immensely successful in this country. And so uh, we often don't think about things, these things because we would rather focus on the pioneer, the rugged individualist. But let's think about it this way. If, um, if Bill Gates and Stephen Jobs had been born in, let's say, Bangladesh, uh, or if they had been taken off when they were five years old and family moved, um, same brilliant minds, same brilliant people, uh, if they were in Bangladesh from the age of five, would they be who they are today? Uh, simply put, our country gets these things right. And how do we get these things right? Well, 
This is where the state comes in. Again, the state has to get property rights right. The state has to get civil rights right. The state has to get legal rights right. They have, and all these things that we really just take for granted. And so while we have a lot of rules and regulations and people say we want to get government off our back, what they really are saying is, yeah, I want government off my back, but I want them on my neighbor's back. And that's part of the thing. Uh, it's part of what, what we really don't understand about the role of the state. The state actually creates the conditions under which wealth is created. If you look at the string of market bailouts um, beginning in the 1980s, going from 1982 and then you, with Mexico, which really wasn't a bailout for Mexico, it was really a bailout for the banks who had overextended themselves, uh, not only to Mexico, but to all of Latin America. And, and if we hadn't done that, then the major banks in the United States would have collapsed. So it wasn't really a bailout for Mexico, it was really a bailout for the banks, the biggest banks in the United States. Well, they proceeded to do this stuff all over again in the 1990s. Uh, we had to bail out long-term capital management in 1987. We had to bail out the uh, savings and loan institutions in the late 80s and early 90s. We had to bail out Mexico again, which really wasn't a bailout for Mexico in 94. Again, it was for the banks. And then we had to bail out Asia. And then you think about continental bank. So you string together all of these bailouts. And what you find is that uh, these big market players uh, are not operating by market rules. They're operating by a completely set, different set of rules that, that you and I don't have access to. You and I can't go to a member of Congress and say, rewrite this piece of legislation for me uh, so I can do this. You know, right before um, the market collapsed in 2008, in 2004, um, the guys on Wall Street went to the Securities and Exchange Commission and they said, you know what, we have all these beautiful investment instruments. But we can't borrow enough because we have these rules that don't permit us to borrow enough so we can invest in these products. And so normally, uh, Wall Street was borrowing at maybe seven to eight times what they had on the books. Um, they went to the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, and said, hey, we need to borrow more. And so the Securities and Exchange Commission, against the wishes of Paul Volcker, um, who was on that committee, said, yeah, why don't we go ahead and do that? Um, and so what you saw was, these investment houses borrowing at rates of 30, 33, 35 to one. And so, if, you know, imagine if you were able to borrow at 30 times what you earned uh, in a year. And then not only borrow at 30 times what you earned in a year, but then go to Vegas and then see how the dice rolls. And then if it doesn't roll the way you want, you're able to say to the house, well, you know what, I think I need another bailout. Uh, there's no house in Vegas that's going to say, okay, we're, we're going to let you gamble again. Well, that's in essence what's happening right now. Uh, these guys are getting another shot at it. When we think about um, uh, what happened in 2008, you have people like Alan Greenspan who talk about it being a, an unforeseen event that we couldn't have predicted that it was going to happen. Absolutely, we could have predicted that this happened and this was going to happen. If you look at the steps, if you look at the deregulation steps, if you look at what Alan Greenspan did with making access to easy money, low interest rates, every time the stock market got into trouble, there was a, uh, Alan Greenspan there to put cheap money into the market. Every time um, a financial institution got into trouble, there were so many bailouts that were led by Alan Greenspan, whether it's long term capital management, whether it was Mexico in 94, whether it was uh, Asia in 97, time after time, um, the private market players got bailed out. And because they continued to get bailed out uh, through the late 80s and the 90s, uh, they just assumed what they were doing was fine. And so uh, there was no penalty. And so the 2008 market collapse was not an unforeseen event. It was a direct result of private players overreaching and trying to deregulate the market so that they could do whatever they wanted to do. And they did. Uh, we, we have committed about $15 trillion, either through credits or guarantees uh, to Wall Street. Uh, for about $4 trillion of that's already out the door. Um, if we had that kind of money and had committed that kind of money to helping the American economy and middle class America, uh, we would have done all right, but what's happened is that we have taken all the money that we have for the bailout and concentrated it mostly with the too big to fail banks and the big firms, financial firms on Wall Street. So uh, to get back to the question, if we had not bailed out Wall Street, there would have been a downturn, absolutely. And it probably been, would have been very significant. 
absolutely no doubt. Uh, but we would have done two things. We would have been able to go in and clean up this mess and say, literally, how, what happened with the banks? But because we bailed out the banks, um, they would not and still will not share any information uh, with regulators or with the government. And so they're able to say, well, wait a minute, we're, we're, we're doing good here. You, you don't need to look at our books. If we had let these guys fail, we could have walked in and taken, taken a look at the books and people would have been in jail. People who are now getting bonuses would have been in jail. And we could have taken the, the trillions of dollars that we've dedicated to Wall Street. And if we had taken that amount and simply dedicated it to creating a jobs program, putting people to work on bridges and roads and the rest of this stuff, um, we would have been much better off. But instead, what we did is we took, uh, we took the money from uh, the Federal Reserve Treasury and just shifted it all over to Wall Street. And if you think about it, it probably is the largest, the most massive transfer of wealth in human history. And why did we do it? Because uh, these guys said, if we don't do it, the market's going to collapse and everything's going to uh, uh, disappear overnight. The economy is going to disappear. We're not going to have an economy in the morning. And, and in, in effect, it was extortion. You need to bail us out or else uh, um, everybody's going down with us. Uh, Washington and Wall Street have this very cozy relationship. Uh, the people in Washington need campaign funds. Uh, the people on Wall Street have lots of money. Uh, every time they need a favor, um, they go to, um, every time the people on Wall Street need a favor, they go to um, Washington and say, uh, we need this, we need that. The market bailout was a classic example of this. You had, for example, investment banks that after the market collapsed uh, were allowed to reclassify themselves as commercial banks. Why? So that they would be eligible for bailout funds and so that they would be eligible for FDIC protection. Um, who gets this type of protection? If you or I, for example, um, go bankrupt, uh, we can't go to Congress and say, hey, well, why don't we reclassify the rules so I don't have to declare bankruptcy? I no longer have to pay these guys back. Um, we can't do that. Uh, the guys on Wall Street can do this, and, and, it, and that's one of the problems. They, they can literally purchase their way out of trouble, and it's one of the reasons why with this bank bailout, um, this bailout of Wall Street, uh, we've probably already sent well over $4 trillion to Wall Street, just already out the door. And uh, I'll give you an example, uh, idea of how much that is. That's, uh, we'll be lucky in 2013 if uh, the entire economy in the United States produces about $16 trillion of goods and services. So in, eff in effect, we gave one quarter of the total value of, our, of our, uh, what our economy is going to produce, uh, perhaps produce this year, um, to Wall Street to help bail them out from some of the things that they were betting and gambling on. So uh, one of the complaints that I hear about um, r regulations is that uh, we, we don't need to regulate markets. We shouldn't regulate markets because market players know what they're doing. Well, what I try to tell students, um, and I say in the book, is that we don't regulate markets. We regulate people. And we regulate people for a reason because uh, history has shown us that we don't often do the right thing. And even though we have the capacity to rationalize, make rational decision, doesn't necessarily make we're mean that we're going to make rational decisions. Um, and so uh, I, I think when we're looking at um, uh, the marketplace, we need to move away from this idea that we're regulating markets. We're not regulating markets. We are regulating people because we don't necessarily have the best history.